Well, today we launch into a new sermon series through the book of Acts. And if there ever was a book for us to be studying now, the book of Acts is an important one. And I'd encourage you along in our study of Acts to pull out your copy of the book Acts of the Apostles. Have you read that book before or parts of it? Uh, It will be an enriching study for you. And if you don't have a copy, we can help you get one. Uh, It's such a good and important book uh, for the times that we're living in. In many Bibles, the book of Acts is titled Acts of the Apostles. But actually, its earliest title is just the word Acts. Uh, And it's rather fitting to call it just Acts, because if you think about all the 11 apostles, and then when you add in uh, the 12th, which chapter 1 talks about, and then later on, the apostle Paul calls himself an apostle, uh, the book of Acts really only covers a couple of apostles. And, And out of the apostles that are covered, it's really mostly Paul towards the later end of things. Uh, And so it's more fitting, I think, that it was originally just titled Acts. Um, And who's the author of the book of Acts? Luke, right. Uh, In fact, the first chapter of Acts actually kind of covers some of the same ground and gives us some new details that the the end, the last chapter of the book of Luke covers. Uh, And Luke, we're told in Scripture, was sometimes a, a companion of the Apostle Paul. So it's very fitting that when he writes a book that has acts, that includes acts of some of the apostles, that he would write from his own experience. He's not writing about people he's never met or or only distantly heard about. He's writing about events, some of which he was there firsthand to witness himself. Acts was written probably in 62, 63 AD before the death of Paul, although there are some who say it could have been written afterwards if you're familiar with the end of the book of Acts, Paul is not yet dead by the time the book ends, but of course we know it's not too much later that he's killed um, in Rome. But some have said, you know what, it doesn't really matter. Paul could have been dead, and Luke may have chosen to leave the book open-ended. Because really, when you think about it, the story of the church doesn't end with the story of Paul. It doesn't end with the story of Peter. The story of the church is still going. Amen? And, and you and I are a part of the story of the church. So my question as we dive into this new book, this new series, what would you like the church historians to write about your part in the story of the church today? He warmed the pew really well. <laughs> right? No. I wanted to say something about how they used their skills, their talents, their abilities. Uh, They were a prayer warrior. Uh, We don't all have the same talents and gifts and abilities, do we? But all of us, as we've talked about before, can do something. So as we dive into Acts chapter 1 this morning... Let's remember, we're a part of this story also. Uh, And we can be inspired by what has come before as we continue moving forward. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up and through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. We covered these first few verses previously, so we're not going to spend much time on them. But Jesus just began the work. He didn't finish the work. Luke didn't say he finished the work. He said he just began it. The work is not finished yet. Otherwise, Jesus would be here, and we'd, or we'd be in heaven with Jesus right now. The work still continues. You remember how we talked about in verse 3, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. He gave them evidence that he was alive, being seen by them during a period of 40 days and speaking to them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He kept on coming back to that topic of the kingdom, 
the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. But then we get to verse 4. It says, and being assembled together with them, Jesus had not yet ascended, it says he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Now, if you'll recall from the Gospels, one of the last commandments Jesus gave to his followers was to go. Get out of here. Spread the good news. But he also gave another command. Before you go, stay. That's kind of confusing, huh? Before you get out of here, you have to stay here. In fact, before you can leave, you must stay. Before you can preach, you've got to pray. Before they can win thousands of souls, they had to search their own souls first. Before they could be filled by the Spirit, they first had to be emptied of self. There was an important work of preparation to do. You know, we, we're used to like preparation, especially as I'm starting to get a little bit older. I'm realizing, you know, it's good to warm up. I went climbing yesterday with Sarah at the gym, and I didn't warm up at all because when we go there, we only have a very brief window of time uh, as we've got Emmeline with us, and it's a joy. But she, you know, is not yet able to be content for long periods of time. Uh, without significant help. She needs naps. She needs food. And so we try to climb as quick as we can. But when I get to the gym, I don't want to spend a long time warming up. But sometimes if you don't warm up, then you feel it later. Uh, those minutes and moments warming up can be important for the long-term success. Jesus knew that there was a, an, a vital message but before sending them out, they had to spend time in prayer. They had to spend time um, confessing their sins. They had to spend time being united together. They had to spend time waiting and preparing for the Holy Spirit. He said, don't leave. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with what? With the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Just hang on a little bit longer. And the Holy Spirit is going to come on you in a powerful way. Now, had the, whole, had the disciples already been filled to some extent by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. I mean, they had already gone out and done missionary work and been used by the Holy Spirit. They had healed people. But this was uh, an, a filling that they had not yet experienced to this point. I remember uh, the story about Dwight Moody. Have you heard of Dwight Moody? One of the most powerful preachers here in America. A and if you have opportunity, read a, a book about Moody. This guy was filled with the Holy Spirit. But early on in his life, he was approached by someone and said, Mr. Moody, the world has yet to see what will happen when a person is fully and wholeheartedly filled by the Spirit of God? And he said back to them, he said, I aim to be that man. I want to be that person. And he did revivals all over the place, largely based out of Chicago. Places that he would preach, they would still be having revival 20 years later. Uh, the effects of that revival would still be going on. I think we're selling ourselves short. I sell myself short with a quick prayer here, quick time in the, in the word. I'm good, I'm good, I, I got it, okay, I'm ready for the day. No. They spent time. How long did they spend in this upper room experience? Ten days, right? Ten days. Uh, and there may have been coming and going, uh, but this was ten days that was, that was earnestly... Uh, spent devoting themselves to seeking the Holy Spirit, to seeking God in prayer. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> you know, it takes a long time to learn things, but sometimes an even longer time to unlearn things. And they had it in their mind, okay, we are going to be exalted as a nation, and we're glorified, and we're going to 
take victory over the Romans, and, and this was just bred into them. Is now the time? And Jesus was gentle with them. Verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Uh, don't worry about the times. Just trust in the Father. You know, what if he had said to them, well, actually, fellas, uh, if you study the prophecies of Daniel, chapter 8, and you see the 2300 days, which are prophetic, which are literal days, you'll see that it's not possible for the times to be before at least like 1800 years, 1800 years from now, and that's the beginning of the end. How would that have affected them? Go out and preach that, well, God's not coming back for forever. And so Jesus just said, hey guys, it's not for you to know the times. Um, and I, I think it's well for us. People try to set dates. Even Adventists, who we've learned the lesson from the Millerites, but we haven't learned. Uh, People are trying to set dates. Oh, but if you look at this and, and interpret it this way, and, and, and it's not for us to know exactly when it's going to happen. I found this massive timeline somewhere in my office, and it, 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 had like a, it felt like a million bits of information on it. it almost impossible to read. Whoa, what is this? Trying to, okay, this, after this happens, and that will happen, and... and we try to get so specific. Maybe, we'll, maybe we're like the disciples. Okay, now is the kingdom going to be established? Jesus said, it's not for you to know these things. Here's what you need to know. Verse 8. But you shall receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. At the right time, you're going to get power. Have any of you ever been boogie boarding or surfing or body surfing before? You ever tried that? I bet Frank has. Yeah, grow, growing up in Hawaii. I'm not a good surfer. Uh, it's much easier to boogie board, but I do enjoy. Whenever I go where there are waves, I can't lay on the shore. I got to be in the water with the waves. Uh, and what I've learned from surfing is you'll tire yourself out paddling your arms if you're doing it at the wrong time. Because sometimes there is a lull and there are not good waves. You have to wait for the right moment and the right wave. You be in the right position and then when you start to paddle and that wave catches you, you feel the power. You feel the power and that it is amazing. It's just one of the best feelings when that wave catches you. It takes you in and you can go all the way into shore. But if you do it at the wrong time, in your own power, you're just tiring yourself out. The Holy Spirit wants to move. And he wanted to move in, in, in those days, just like he wants to move in our day. But if we're not waiting day by day, seeking day by day, uh, if we're not going in cooperation and harmony with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of things, and we're not <coughs> going to be having the impact we want to have. Jesus says, you will receive power. Holy Spirit there, uh, the, the word there for power is dunamis in Greek, from which we get the English word dynamite. The Holy Spirit is like dynamite. What do you need more power for in your life? What do you need more power for? To witness. Yeah, that's the purpose. It's not power of the Holy Spirit so I can be a better rock climber. Right? Although I want to be a witness while I'm climbing. The, the Holy Spirit was given because the, the work of spreading the gospel to the world is impossible in our own strength. We need more power. They needed more power. And so Jesus says, there's going to be dynamite power on you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses. Greek word there, uh, marturas, from which the word martyr comes. 
Uh, but it didn't have the meaning of, you're going to give up your life to death. You're just going to be my witness. And then eventually, apparently later on, the witnesses ended up resulting in giving their lives. But Jesus says, you're going to be my witness. In, in what locations? Starting in Jerusalem, moving on to where? Judea, and then Samaria, and finally where? To the ends of the earth. These are concentric circles expanding like a ripple in a pond. You throw a rock into a pond and the, the rings, the ripples go further and further out. They were to start right there in Jerusalem. And this is actually a good kind of template for us when we try to be a witness. Who should we start with? Well, the people that are closest to us. Family, friends, close associates. People that we already have a close connection to. We can invite them to the, to the Camp Wawona if they're kids, neighbor kids. Invite them to the Camp Wawona experience at CVCA. $20? Powerful. Uh, and there may be uh, a vacation Bible school that's going to be happening soon also. Uh, start with the people that are closest to you. And then move on out. People else, uh, elsewhere in your neighborhood or your workplace. People that you meet in, in, in town. Um, people that are uh, expanding further and further. Interestingly enough, as you read the book of Acts, this is kind of a, a, an outline for the book of Acts. The first seven chapters deal with events surrounding Jerusalem. Um, and then the next couple of chapters deal with events that are a little bit further out. And the last portion of Acts, the final chapters deal with the greater extent of the Roman world. God wanted them to have power. He wants us to have power. And he had a couple more instructions for them in verse 9. He said, uh, it says, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? What are you doing just staring? He's given you some commandments. Stay and then go. Why do you stand gazing? This same Jesus, who is taking up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming back. How did he go up? Well, literally, visibly, personably, audibly, he's coming back that way. Not secretly, silently, invisibly. Why are you just standing here? He's coming back. And so they did, they did what Jesus said. Verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Sabbath day's journey was a practice in those days, just a tradition. There was no biblical basis for it. And it was about 3,000 feet or so. So they could go 3,000 feet on the Sabbath. So most of us could not make it to church if that was a biblical command because probably none of us live that close. We don't even have anybody living in the house anymore. Um, it, it may be that the 3,000 feet came from a, a rabbinic belief that that was the furthest distance somebody in the wilderness during Moses' day would have to travel to get to the sanctuary on the Sabbath. So you can go that far and no further. But anyways, they traveled back to Jerusalem. Verse 13, and when they entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying. Who was there? Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Bartholomew, and Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. The eleven apostles were there. But notice who else was there. Verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his who? His brothers. And that's remarkable. Because if you read the Gospels, the brothers of Jesus, they were not convinced. They were aloof concerning his ministry. They didn't seem to believe in him. Certainly not as Messiah or as God. But something happened on that resurrection morning. Something happened in those 40 days. And they came to realize just who Jesus was. 
There's so many reasons to believe in God and believe in Jesus. And the fact that the brothers were there shows us, the skeptical brothers were there shows us something happened, and they now were followers too. They were there in the upper room also. Well, what were they doing in the upper room? What does the Bible say in verse 14? They were with one accord, which just basically means they had one mind and one purpose. They were no longer debating. Hey, uh, who do you think is the greatest? <laughs> I mean, who's best among us? Who gets to sit closest in the kingdom? They weren't doing that. They had stopped their frivolity and they were now with a mission and with a purpose. They had good news to spread to the world. But first, they were seeking and awaiting the most important gift that would help them to fulfill their mission, which was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says they continued with prayer and supplication. What would it be like if we spent more time following after this example? Do you think we would be more effective in our ministry if we spent more time in prayer? Yeah. Would we be more effective if we said, you know what, this other stuff is important, but maybe we could just devote a little bit more time? Do you think you'd have more patience in your life, more strength to witness, more, more courage to be a witness if you spent a few more minutes in the morning Seeking dynamite, dunamis, power, the Holy Spirit. Would we have more strength to resist temptation if we spent less time on our smartphones, less time on our computers? And I'm talking to myself. You just get to listen. Do you think we'd have more strength? Would we have more power? I fear we are selling ourselves far too short. We're settling for far too little. What would happen if, like Dwight Moody of ages past, if we said, I aim to be a spirit-filled person. I aim to be a person that is fully used, fully emptied day by day of self and my own mission, and fully day by day accepting God's mission, accepting His strength, accepting His power, and living by his word. Do you think we'd look back from heaven and regret it? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. A number of years ago, there was a missionary doctor in China, and he was doing eye work, helping heal people with glaucoma and other similar maladies. And he, he healed a, a Chinese farmer who his glaucoma was so bad, or I'm sorry, he had cataracts that were so bad that he couldn't even see. He was eff effectively blind. And after the surgery, he could see again. And he was so excited. He, he went off um, leaving the mission compound, and he went off into kind of the Chinese interior, off into the villages. A few days later, he came back with a rope in his hand, and he was leading a group of blind people who were hanging onto the rope. When he got to their villages, he, he didn't know exactly what medications were used, what the name of the procedure was. He didn't even know, you know what conditions he'd been operated on. It's really sterile. You should go there. He didn't know any of that stuff. All he knew was, there's a guy. I was blind, and now I can see. Do you want to come meet this guy? Do you want to come see if he can help you out? And they did. We're not all preachers. We're not all teachers. We're not all evangelists. We haven't all gone to the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism or Arise. or We haven't all done those things. But all of us have had an encounter with Jesus. All of us, if Jesus has been in our life, we have a story to tell. We have a testimony to share. 
And one of the most powerful testimonies is something like this. I struggle with my temper, but the other day I was tempted to get mad and I prayed and God helped me not lose my cool. You can share that with someone. That's powerful. That's life transformation. That's the gospel. Part of the good news is that Jesus wants to change our life. There's so many facets of the good news. So as we start the book of Acts, remember, you and I, we're part of the story. There's not chapter 1,587,268, but if there was, maybe there'd be a part of it that's about Parkwood Church. So do we want to commit daily to waiting? Uh, one of our dangers is we're good at the waiting part. Okay, God, we'll wait for, yeah, we'll wait and, and do nothing. And then we're on the, as our conference president wisely said, we're on the 500 year plan to get the Lord back just a little bit at a time. And we're, it doesn't work like that. The purpose of waiting, which by the way, we wait every day. You can have an upper room experience in some way every day as you connect with God, be filled by God, and are sent out by God. But I want God to write a good chapter, a good story about us this week. How about you? You want to be used by God? Let's bow our heads. Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that in spite of our faults, in spite of knowing us to the core, you still want to use us. Uh, and we're honored by that. And we know we're the, we're the ones who will get the biggest blessing as we make ourselves available to you day by day. So Lord, help us to seek you more earnestly than we do. If there are things, a Holy Spirit quenching activities or things in our life, point them out to us. Because we can't be allowing the Spirit to be quenched. We need to be filled. We need that power. And Lord, we're going to look back in heaven someday with great joy at the way that you used us. So give us um, what we need. Equip us and give us courage and opportunities and boldness this week as we tell others about you and how good you are. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, let all of God's servants say, Amen.